But if you observe other people who are further down the path and imitate that, you can do it better. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, I want to tell you a story about my granddaughter. Oh, well, (laughs) I know you think you have the cutest, smartest little, what is she, four years old? She's four, yeah. Yeah, In the world. Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Of course. It's actually kind of a reverse cutest, smartest. But whenever she gets ready for bed at night, she wants to make sure that she is wearing the exact same jammies as her little brother. Oh. They, she just wants to make sure that they match all the time. Mm. And I just think, and then when I go and visit them, because they live in California, of course, I live in Oklahoma, I try to be very intentional about bringing clothes that I know she has something similar to, like my black and white striped shirt. she can match you. Because she likes to match me. Isn't that cute? So I just just love this age. Well, it makes Christmas shopping for two kids easy. You (laughs) just, you know, find one thing and buy two different sizes, right? Yeah, that kind of works. Sometimes it doesn't always work because... I have and a your grand- brother's what two now? You know, he's a year and a half. Okay, almost yeah. here. Yeah. So of course, our topic for today is imitation, which is exactly what Lucy likes to do: is imitate or have others imitate her. Well, I I kind of got into the exploration of this topic when I came kind of face to face with people who would be suspicious. Mm or even fearful of our approach, especially in the first few units, of having kids, you know, have a source text and then rewrite basically the same content, give them a story. They get to retell the same story. We give them information. And they look at this and say, but where's the creativity? Mm -hmm. You know, writing is about creativity and exploration and self-expression and Mm -hmm. imagination and... This isn't that. And so, you know, over the years, we've come up with various ways to help people understand. Number one, that's where we start, but that isn't where we stop. Right. And number two, this approach, it's, an, it's a tried and true method. Learning a skill by imitation is pretty much the only way to get started learning a skill. Sure, absolutely. And it becomes a little more obvious if you point out, well, what about music, Mm -hmm. right? You don't just give someone an instrument or say, sit down at the piano and fool around for a while. You say, do this, do this in this way. Imitate me. Any art program that has any success at all is based on, okay, if you want to learn to draw a face, well, First you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and you practice until you can get the proportions right Mm -hmm. without copying the model. For some reason, writing in people's minds is different Hmm. and that it should just flow spontaneously from (laughs) the heart and mind of the innocent, Mm -hmm. happy, expressive, creative person. Right. So – you know, so I, in in trying to help bridge this, I've talked a lot about imitation, and uh, I have some quotes. Oh, great! I, great. I like quotes mm-hmm. because then it makes you sound smarter than you actually. No, <laughs> it's it's a form of imitation. Yes, it is. <laughs> but there's kind of two views that are typified by some of these quotes. The first quote is from Edmund Burke back in the mid-1700s, and he said, quote, It is by imitation far more than by precept that we learn everything, and what we learn thus we acquire not only more effectually but more pleasantly. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting is imitation versus precept. Precept okay. would mean concept, and you can you can kind of simplify that by saying, "I can show you, or I can tell you. Mm-hmm. I can give you examples, or I can try to explain the principles." Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And I do think that in our modern American approach to education. We have veered away from teaching by example, and tried to do everything by explaining the concepts. Right. Yep. And then, if it doesn't work, if we don't get a desired result, we try to re-explain the concepts <laughs> and just remediate and re-explain until things get better.、Mm-hmm. Whereas, if we just stop talking. Mm. And kind of start showing,、mm-hmm. we might get better results.、Mm-hmm. So that quote by Burke, you know, I think you know he was obviously a brilliant political philosopher, mind of his time. He was observing that tension between imitation and explanation. Yeah,、um, a similar quote from someone who lived、uh, about fifty years, maybe a hundred years later. Uh, Edward Bulwer Lytton, he said. Now this is this is where we get past just Burke's observation into part of the meat of the idea. Imitation, if noble and general, ensures the best hope of originality. Oh, interesting. So we would tend to think, oh no, if you're just drawing a picture someone else drew,、mm-hmm. if you're just playing a piece of music that someone else. Created.、Mm-hmm. If you're just writing content that you just read, where's the originality、mm-hmm. in there?、Mm-hmm. But、uh, this quote indicates that imitation is actually the foundation for the basic skills that then make originality, creativity, innovation possible.、Mm-hmm. And that was echoed by one of my favorite guys. He's Still alive, doing a lot. His show, Dirty Jobs,、oh, right. was very well known for, by many people. Mike, Mike Rowe. Rowe, yeah, okay. And I, w- I would encourage everyone if you haven't been exposed to Mike Rowe, just、uh, go to YouTube and put in his name, Mike R O W E, and he's got a TED Talk. He's got some other videos. Brilliant, brilliant insights. But he said this statement: innovation without imitation. Is a complete waste of time, hmm. Hmm. and you know that's that whole thing. Here's paper and a bunch of paints. Have at it, right? right? I, I mean, is this really a good use of anyone's time? However, the opposite view, expressed by Ralph Waldo Emerson,、hmm. mid 1800s, envy is ignorance, imitation is suicide, and so we see kind of the modernism, the anti willingness. To build on what has come before, so imitation, in a way, requires some humility,、hmm. and I think that's why some people ha- have a problem with it. You know, it's like, so I have to do what someone else did to learn how to do this. I don't like that.、Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you you have to humble yourself.、Mm-hmm. And say I can learn.、Mm-hmm. I'm not the best at this already. Well, Whatever and, that is. And isn't it Sir Isaac Newton who said, "I'm able to do what I'm doing because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants." Yes,、yeah. I think so. So the whole idea of you, there has to be something for you to have a foundation that you're that you're building on, and children certainly don't have life experiences to be able to create without. Without an educational term, they call it scaffolding. Like, what kind of help can you give them、right. to be successful? And I think imitation is one of those really powerful tools that we would be remiss to neglect. Yeah, and like I said, there's that tension、mm-hmm. between I want to do my own thing, but I need to imitate someone who's better than me. Right. One of the little things I love to say to people. And I like to say it as fast as possible, just to kind of make their eyes roll in their head a little bit, and then unpack it. Is 
if you just do what you can do, you will be able to do what you can do because you're doing what you can do, but you won't be able to do anything you can't do because you're only doing what you can do. Something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and they're like, ah. But you, you see, the idea is if you just keep operating within the limits of your own amount of information or experience or something, you're kind of stuck there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But if you observe other people who are further down the path and imitate that, you can do it better. And this is true whether you're talking about a golf swing mm-hmm. or you know drawing again. I, I remember hating drawing. I hated art in school. I really intensely hated art art class Mm. because from a very early age, I viewed everything I did as ugly Mm. and stupid and not good. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how I could possibly get past that. I think a lot of kids get stuck there, whether it's art as it was for me or something else they're doing, sport or music or or, or writing. They don't know what to do. Yeah. And that's probably the most depressing thing you could have happen in a day is you you have a task and, and someone says, do this. And you say, well, I don't know how. I don't mm-hmm. know what to do. Right. Well, right. figure it out. Okay. Just, you know, kill me now. I'll go back to bed. I, you know, <laughs> can I procrastinate? Can yes. I argue my way out of it? Mm-hmm. So having that that vision of what's possible because you've seen someone else do it Mm -hmm. allows you to improve in every possible way. Sure. And, you know, with adults, we we tend to do this automatically without thinking. Mm -hmm. We we see someone do something and we say, if I did it more like that, I would do it better than I'm doing it. Children may not have that conscious of an awareness Mm -hmm. of that's what's going on, but they just unconsciously imitate. I mean, that's the reason our children and grandchildren speak English and not Chinese, right? Right. (laughs) It's it's 100% imitation. Sure. So then the question is, what is creativity? What is creativity? Uh, Well, you know, that's a big (laughs) time. I mean, volumes and volumes have been written. But what I have come to, to believe is that creativity is really the combination and permutation of previously existing elements in what appears to be a unique way. And uh, we, we can look at the world of Legos. I, everybody knows Legos, and almost every kid likes Legos right. or something very similar mm-hmm. to that. And I watch my grandsons and their capacity to play with Legos for hours of intense concentration astounds me. Right. Because I can't even comfortably sit on the floor for 20 minutes (laughs) and I get bored with Legos really fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's always this tension like, Grandpa, play Legos with us. Sorry. (laughs) Or no. (laughs) Or Okay, but only for 20 minutes, right? Right. But their ability, and why is that? Right. It's because they have the pieces. Mm -hmm. They didn't create those pieces. Those pieces pre-existed. And, of course, the Lego company has been very good at creating more and more and more pieces, some of which are very rare Mm -hmm. and go for – you know, a lot of money on eBay because everybody wants those pieces. Right. Yes, and then you can get that the the soldier and the castle and all the different pieces and you put it together and you make it look just like that. Exactly. Or you make your own thing now that you've done just that and you make your own thing and now you're creating. And there you have it. There's mm-hmm. the the variance in the combination and permutation. Right. Ah. And And that is what children just really love to see. Mm -hmm. Like, here was the spaceship that was in the picture. I did that. Now, here's a different spaceship Mm -hmm. that they can make with those pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this extends into music. When you think about it, there's really no entirely unique 
ideas in music.、Mm-hmm. Like everything is similar in some way to something that came before it.、Mm-hmm. Only there might be something that sounds very innovative. Right. Like oh wow, I've never heard that quite that way before. Sure. Yeah. And so with our teaching of writing, you know, we're we're giving them. The Lego pieces. We're giving them the note pattern combinations,、right. the scales, etudes,、mm-hmm. arpeggios, and then they can pull pieces of that and put it together and be very and have a very satisfying experience.、Mm-hmm. I think I, my first insight into this was before I had even imagined、uh, starting IEW. Oh, okay. I was teaching violin. And I wanted to encourage、um, improvisation、oh, skills, right. Uh-huh. right? Which means you pick up your violin and you play something, just on the spur of the moment, no printed notes.、Mm-hmm. You just make it up. And what I noticed was that the students who had memorized and maintained their memorized repertoire、oh. were much more facile. At improvisation, than the students who had not acquired or who had not maintained a memorized repertoire. One group had more pieces to play with; the、sure. other group had fewer. Yes. Consequently, the kids who really enjoyed improvisation, and I had a, a little program where you could kind of turn on、um, like a, a rhythmic bass line,、mm, mm-hmm. and then you would play on top of that. I see. Right. right? Yeah, that makes sense. And the kids who really loved that were the ones who had been the most diligent、mm-hmm. about learning very precisely the pieces and the techniques that I had been teaching them, and not forgetting them, and not forgetting them.、Mm-hmm. So I, I actually wrote the very first article in the very first newsletter that I ever put together was for my my music teaching、oh, business,、okay. uh-huh. and. Uh, the title of the article was "Why Music May Save the World."、Ah. Now, this was an allusion to Pablo Casals, who played at the United Nations and made this very bold statement that music will save the world.、Mm. I, I'm not sure that's going to happen, <laughs> but my twist was music may save the world because it's the last discipline that you could deconstruct. Right? You can deconstruct art. We saw that happen all through the 20th century,、mm. and even going to the point where people would just randomly throw paint on a canvas and then try to sell it for a hundred thousand dollars, and people would buy it.、Mm-hmm. I mean, that used to be sensible compared to non fungible tokens of ridiculous stuff that doesn't even exist, and people are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and you just get into this. But so I looked at art, and then, then I was looking at at kind of the literature, right?、Oh, Where do we push、right. the limits on what is acceptable? And then, kind of with this explosion of this worshiping of creativity、mm-hmm. that probably started in the '60s and '70s, but was really entrenched, I think, in the pedagogical philosophy, if you、mm-hmm. will. By the '90s, when I was doing this teaching,、mm-hmm. and I thought, you know, you you can deconstruct language, go all the way back to E. Cummings, and look at poets and people who've tried to break rules. You can keep doing that. You can deconstruct almost every discipline, but if you deconstruct music, it ceases to exist. It's no longer music. It yeah, which is would describe a lot of. <laughs> What we might hear today on TikTok, but、uh, but my argument was that the teaching of music、mm. will preserve sanity in education, and I never imagined I would thirty years later be sitting here doing a podcast and having you know this opportunity to teach writing to dozens. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people、yes. influenced that far、yeah. out, and so I, I think we all need to remind ourselves the value of imitation when we're teaching children, because then we can do it more intentionally. Yes, they'll imitate whatever happens. Yes, <laughs> whether it's intentional or accidental.、Mm-hmm. 
and we all have had the experience of a child or a grandchild saying something that we wish they had not said. <laughs> Why did they say it? Well, they were imitating us who said something that we probably shouldn't have said. Or, yeah, or someone. They heard <laughs> yeah. it somewhere. Yeah. So that's kind of the way, you know, we've gone. And I've, I've noticed this about myself. I'm trying to learn some new things. Mm. And if I just go and do it the way, what I'm talking about is weight training. Okay. Right? Yeah. Because you know, I'm kind of on this health kick. Yes. You know, Andrew, when I first met you, I asked you if you ever go jogging or work out or anything. And you were just like, no, never. And yet here you are, almost 15 years later, wanting to leave. How much, Do you need me for anything else today? Because I got to go to the gym. <laughs> no, don't don't expose my, my bad <laughs> habits here. But... <laughs> Going to the gym is not a bad habit. Well, it might be if it's in the middle of the day and I have real work to do. <laughs> but but my my point is, is it's very interesting. If I just do it the way I think, mm -hmm. it's not as good as if I do it the way my personal trainer, who happens to be my son, mm -hmm. shows me, right? Right. And it's not necessarily easy to do it the way he shows me <laughs> no. because like anything, there is an art form to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I used to really sneer upon, mm. I used to look down upon that kind of thing, mm -hmm. thinking, well, you're just, you know, moving weights up and down so you can look buff and impress people. But, you know, having learned a lot about the very significant health and longevity benefits okay. of of resistance training, mm -hmm. I, I got interested. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed that there are people in that gym who've been doing this a lot longer than I do. Yes. And if I watch their form, mm. then when I go try to do that the next time, whatever it is, squats, deadlift, I don't know, that's in my mind. And so I gain greater benefit. And I don't have any expectation to ever be innovative Mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. But there were people who were innovative sure. in the past, and there are people who are innovative now. But you have to reach a certain level of mastery before it's even worth doing it. As Mike Rowe said, innovation without imitation is a complete waste of time. Right. And I don't want to waste my time because right. I don't have that much of it. Right. <laughs> well, Andrew, you mentioned several things that causes me to point to your book, However Imperfectly. Because that article that you were talking about, we do the book. It's a collection of your articles over the last 30 years of teaching. And, of course, the very first article you wrote is the very last article in that book. Oh, it goes and from it, more recent to yes, distant. Yes, okay. exactly. And so that, um, Why Music May Save the World, is in that book, as well as a few articles on, on yeah. imitation and um, the one that you mentioned about creativity and how that's the new God, and we need to be careful of that. Mm -hmm. So I would highly recommend to our listeners getting the book, however imperfectly, link in the show notes. And if you are a premium member, one of our thousands of premium members, you know that you have a coupon, or maybe you don't know, but you have a coupon in your account to get that book absolutely free. And oftentimes, Andrew, people will who are ordering that book ask to have you autograph that for them. And that's always a joy to have you personalize that book to them. So lots of great content in there. Yeah. Well, it's a good subject. Um, I'm continuing to think about it. And I'm working on a conference talk mm. that I'm going to do this year at, at least six times. Oh, wow. Six uh -huh. different places. And without giving too much away, I have come to see the importance of three things. One is code, meaning mm. the rules, mm. creed, meaning the understanding of things, and then culture, meaning the community that reinforces that. Mm -hmm. And these three things kind of operate together, but the code is first. So if you want to learn a new thing, you would say, what are the rules of this, right? What are the do's and don'ts? And that's the first thing you need to learn. Then the next thing you need to learn is 
Why is that so? What what are the principles and mechanics and reasons for those rules? Because that allows you then to continue to follow the rules. Right, exactly. Right? Because if it's just mom said so or dad said so, then you're, there's kind of like a Right, well, and, to... you, and you notice that children go through this same developmental stage. Sure. In the beginning, you just tell them, do this, don't do that. Right. And you don't need an explanation. But right. then they start pestering you. Well, why? Mm-hmm. Then you start to explore the understanding of this. Mm -hmm. Here's what we know. Right. Here's what we believe. This is why we do or don't do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a general life thing. Right. As well as getting really specific about how to clean a bathroom or how to paint a picture. Right. And then there's culture, which is where you operate in a group of like-minded people and you are able to share those rules and mm-hmm. those reasons for the reasons, rules. Mm-hmm. The, the, the code and the creed mm-hmm. in order to build something together. Right. I love that. And we, you know, we see that in families. We see that in educational communities, right? Yep. A, a school with no code isn't going to work, right? You, we see it in churches. We see it almost in the tradition of the history of mankind when it comes to religious belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was the first thing? The code. Mm -hmm. Here's the rules. Not a whole lot of explanation. Here's the rules. You follow them. Mm -hmm. And that defined the people, right? Mm -hmm. If you follow the rule, you were one of the tribe, and if you didn't, you weren't. Right, right. Then there was a new phase of understanding what we believe and why we believe that and how the belief informs the, the rules. So the creed illuminates the code. And then the third phase is we, we form communities and churches. And this is true for, I would say, all faith traditions. We form communities where we then apply and do good work in the world yep. because we have the code and the creed. And when we, when we lose those things, when we no longer have the rules to operate by, we, we lose our, our grounding. Mm-hmm. When we question everything and we no longer have things that we can believe, then we lose our motive for doing things. Mm-hmm. And we can no longer operate in community to a good end. So anyway, I'm going to unpack this idea uh, more in, in more depth at this convention convention season. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of both nervous and excited about yeah. it because it's kind of my my cutting edge thinking at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. What is the name of the convention talk so that those that are going to a homeschool convention this year can look It's for not that? an attractive name. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll tell you. Preparation for mm. persecution. Ah. A most necessary curriculum. Ah. Okay. Okay. So look for that one. Take it or leave it. And know that he's going to be talking about code, creed, and culture. I like it. Among other things. Among other things, right. Well, this has been interesting and informative and inspiring all at once. Well, we hope so. That's why we do this, right? That is why we do this. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.